Hello, and welcome to On Watch by Market Watch. I'm Jeremy Owens. The decline of America's most storied semiconductor company has reached a new low. On Monday, Intel Chief Executive Pat Gelsinger retired after less than four years on the job and just days after the U.S. government promised the company up to nearly $8 billion. This news and what it signifies for Intel, the AI boom, and the long-brewing semiconductor arms race between the U.S. and China is incredibly important. So we're going to dive into it today with the help of two experts on semiconductors. Ryan Shrout, who worked at Intel during Gelsinger's tenure, and the author of Chip Wars, Chris Miller. Plus, we'll tell you about the news we're watching this week and how it will impact your wallet. We begin with Intel. Breaking news, Intel announcing the retirement of the CEO, Pat Gelsinger. The board has formed a search committee for his successor. I joined Intel in 2018. I left at the end of 23, so he was kind of leading the helm for half of my time there, more or less. I spoke with Ryan Shrout, president of Signal 65, Market Watch columnist, and a former Intel employee. It was a breath of fresh air to have an engineering-minded first CEO at what most people consider an engineering first company or what people believe should be an engineering first company. But the investors in the market want change and they want it pretty quick. And Intel has been fairly, you know, I was going to say stagnant, but it's been down over his tenure while the rest of the market has been skyrocketing upwards. Intel is a company that defined the semiconductor industry and its native home, Silicon Valley. It was the most valuable chip maker in the world for years. But after missing the smartphone boom, Intel has watched NVIDIA take control of investment in the chip sector thanks to advances in artificial intelligence. And the two areas where Intel remained the unquestioned leader, semiconductors for personal computers and servers, became more competitive. Advanced Micro Devices, or AMD, stepped up its game as Intel struggled to manufacture the best chips available. And it left the gap open for AMD to very slowly gain market share and slowly gain product relevance in that field. And then the NVIDIA one is very different in that Intel was not in graphics. They did not build discrete GPUs. And their failure there was more of not seeing the AI revolution coming that Jensen and NVIDIA did see. And then everybody talks about the iPhone misstep that Intel had, right? That they had the option to build the chip for it and passed on it. And now look at that. I think all those things kind of add up into an environment that takes you from the darling to struggling. This is the environment that welcomed Pat Gelsinger back to Intel. Gelsinger worked his way up through the company and really believed in its ability to rule the chip sector before he left to eventually become CEO of VMware. When he returned as CEO of Intel in early 2021, he faced years of failed efforts to turn the company around and needed a signature effort of his own. His idea? Focus on the biggest difference between Intel and its two biggest American rivals, AMD and NVIDIA. That difference is that Intel still manufactures chips in what's called a foundry business, while the two rivals design their chips and trust in other companies, mostly TSMC, to make them. By focusing on the foundry business, Intel conceivably could develop its own next generation chips while generating extra money by manufacturing chips for third parties. But what Gelsinger wanted is not something that happens quickly or cheaply. Changing direction in silicon takes a long time, whether that be from a manufacturing standpoint and actually making the chips to actually designing and productizing IP in the same realm. So I, I think three years is on the short side of kind of the, the time that you can be held responsible for what's happening. But that's just not how almost anything else in the world works. If you look at the AI revolution that we have seen, think about how different it is today than almost four years ago. And then you have to question, should Intel have been more involved with it in that four year window, even not even like, you know, the kind of the build up to get to participation, but what should it have been doing or could have been doing in these last four years? One thing Gelsinger did in these last four years, secure funding from the US government to develop their manufacturing business. That funding has totaled up to nearly $11 billion. 
that nearly 8 billion we mentioned earlier, and an additional 3 billion to develop chips for the US military. Both of these are from the Biden administration's Chips and Science Act. After Gelsinger's ouster, I called up Chris Miller, author of Chip Wars and an assistant professor at Tufts University, to talk about Gelsinger's legacy and the challenges still facing Intel. I think the, the board is going to have to think long and hard about whether the foundry strategy still makes sense. If Gelsinger couldn't pull it off, it's not clear why a new CEO will be able to pull it off. Yeah, I think you said it best there, Chris. If Pat Gelsinger can't do this, who can't? This is a guy who understands Intel top to bottom, understands chip manufacturing. Who are they going to find who's actually going to do a better job than Pat Gelsinger is a, a flashing question in my mind right now as we get into the CEO search for Intel. But I think that the challenge that Gelsinger faced is that the problems he was confronting were problems that emerged out of decisions made a decade before he was appointed CEO. And the long time horizons of research and development and of the investment cycles in this industry meant that although he wanted to turn the ship pretty quickly, it just couldn't turn fast enough to make his approach viable. I think that the one criticism of Gelsinger's approach that I, I think is valid is that it was to some degree overly optimistic. Last year, not just Pat Gelsinger, but much of the market thought that Intel might be at, at a turnaround point. And I think AI was actually the problem that it faced and that AI caused a further deterioration in the server business, which has been a major financial problem for Intel over the past, not just year, but really two years. And so perhaps that over-optimism is the factor that led the board to call for his retirement. Now the company has to ask itself a question, if it's not going to go in the foundry direction, what's the alternative? The alternative that many have floated is a breakup of Intel, where the foundry business and the chip design business are split into separate companies. Ryan Shrout believes the board will have to go with that option. It would very much surprise me if a split of the company isn't happening right, that they aren't going to separate manufacturing out from product, from IP. And if you do that, then I think you can find the right leadership for both of those independent groups that can have success. But I think trying to take lead of this combined entity now would be really, really difficult. After talking with Ryan and Chris, I agree that the most likely path forward for Intel here is to split the company into two businesses. You'd have a chip maker like AMD or Nvidia and a foundry business like TSMC. And for investors, that's probably a good idea. Those two businesses split apart are likely more valuable than they would be put together. But for the long term, that is not going to return Intel to its former glory. In fact, it probably kills that dream that Gelsinger had when he returned to Intel. We're gonna take a quick break. Coming up, we'll dive deeper into the US's role in semiconductor manufacturing and the path for AI in 2025. Welcome back. We've given you the Intel story, but there's plenty more to talk about. In fact, I'm, I'm gonna be honest here. We scheduled these interviews well before knowing that there would be an Intel CEO change to discuss. And that's because there are fundamentally crucial issues to talk about beyond Intel in the semiconductor sector. The US has been in a semiconductor arms race with China that dates back years, if not decades. And the latest move in that battle was new restrictions on semiconductor sales into China, introduced by the Biden administration earlier this week. In addition, the Biden administration has been dispersing funding from the Chips and Science Act, as we mentioned earlier. This act is the follow through of a bipartisan congressional push toward increasing domestic chip manufacturing that began in 2019 during Trump's first term. Chris Miller, who you heard before the break, literally wrote the book about this battle. It's called Chip Wars, and we wanted to ask him what we can expect for AI and chip development in the coming years. Well, I think industry has been pushing the government to be faster with the CHIPS grant disbursements for the past couple of years. So we shouldn't be surprised to see the current team trying to wrap up the first round of grants uh, before their term ends. And I think there's a lot of bipartisan support in Congress, uh, in particular for the CHIPS Act in general, as well as the grant strategy that the Commerce Department has been deploying. So I don't think we should expect major changes to the CHIPS Act. 
I think the government also took a very deliberate approach trying to give multiple companies grants rather than betting on a single winner, which means that even if one company underperforms, there will be other companies that will likely do better than expected. And certainly in the case of the production of advanced logic chips, the processor chips that go in phones or AI systems, you've got three companies that can make them, Intel, TSMC, and Samsung. And the government rightly uh, predicted that it wouldn't know which company is best suited to win. So it made a bet on all three of those companies, each of which is getting a chipset grant. And this is really a push to build up U.S. manufacturing. And I think we should zoom in on Intel for just a second. There is speculation that Intel might break into two. And I could see why the U.S. government, after investing a ton of money into Intel directly, might not want to see the company kind of split up and broken apart. That's right. And Intel's also, in addition to having received a Chips Act grant, also been selected uh, to receive federal funding to produce chips for the military and intelligence agencies, uh, which, again, is a signal that the U.S. government thinks that it is important to have cutting edge chip production onshore run by a U.S. company for security reasons. And so balancing that desire with the desire of Intel investors not to be on the hook for uh, tens of billions of dollars of capital expenditure over the next couple of years is going to be a very difficult uh, balance to strike. And there is a global element to this. The CHIPS Act is kind of the response the U.S. made to China and its big plan to really ramp up compute power and AI capability, right? That's right. And the Chinese have uh, very clearly articulated that building a self-sufficient chip industry is a core goal of national politics. They've also signaled that they believe AI will be a critical uh, technology, not just for economic purposes, but also for military and strategic purposes. And that's why China is putting much more money than the U.S. into trying to build out these chip making capabilities. The problem that they face is that when it comes to the tools that are used to manufacture chips, U.S. firms, as well as Dutch and Japanese, these firms have capabilities that no one in China can match, which is why Chinese firms are uh, given no other choice but to try to smuggle in ships or buy second rate ships from Western suppliers. Yeah. And when you say China is trying to build a self-sufficient chip industry, I, I could replace U.S. in that sentence and go with the CHIPS Act. I mean, that's really what the CHIPS Act is about, trying to bring manufacturing of chips back to the U.S. and, and development of chips back to the U.S. and out of Taiwan, right? I, I would disagree with with the framing. I think the U.S. has been pretty clear that it wants to keep, keep international supply chains structured the way they are, it wants to keep cooperation with the Netherlands, keep cooperation with Japan, keep it with Korea. There is concern about over-concentration in Taiwan. And today, 99% of all AI processor chips are manufactured in Taiwan. And so you can understand why U.S. policymakers think there's a risk that if China carries through on its threats to Taiwan, the impact economically and technologically would be huge. But ultimately, the U.S. isn't going for self-sufficiency. It's going to protect the Western supply chain that has provided so many any technological and economic benefits to the U.S. Well, with that in mind, tell me about the Biden administration's new restrictions on China. Can we just talk about those restrictions and what they're meant to do? The current restrictions are really focused on the chips that make AI possible, as well as the tools that are used to manufacture the chips that are used in AI. And the aim of the restrictions is to make sure that the most advanced chips and the most advanced chip making tools are only sold to either U.S. firms or firms in friendly countries, not to China. The logic being that if China manages to catch up in AI or even take a leadership position in AI, it will be bad, not just economically, it'll be bad strategically for the United States because ultimately artificial intelligence will be used both for chatbots, but also for military and intelligence applications. And it's not that these are keeping AI chips from making it to China. You know, NVIDIA has made its own versions, especially for China, that are not quite as advanced as what American companies get. So that it's not cutting off all avenues for American tech companies in China, just like the most advanced chips are not making it over the borders, or are they? It's certainly true that there have been restrictions on the most advanced chips. It's also true that we've seen uh, plenty of pieces of evidence that China is smuggling in at least moderate volumes of the most advanced chips. I think it's something that the Trump administration will intensify focus on because it's not only about the chips themselves, it's about the AI capabilities that they enable. The AI capabilities that semiconductors are making possible is why the sector is so hot right now. So we wanted to talk with Ryan Shroud, the CEO of Signal 65, you heard from him earlier, 
about where AI is getting more capable thanks to these next generation semiconductors and where it's going to head next, especially for consumers. There's two pieces of this. The first one is the idea of commercial versus consumer usages. And the second one is legitimately useful consumer usages. So on, on the first one, what I think is interesting to think about is an everyday person on their smartphone or on their laptop is generally a content consumer. They are not a content creator, right, by and large. And AI doesn't really help you consume content, media, what have you, that much better. You can use it to, uh, let's say, summarize some article, uh, summarize some PDF. You can use it as a, a, you know, a different kind of search than Google traditionally offers, right? Those are kind of consumption-based models. But the, the creation side, when you get into the commercial space, of productivity users, video editing, audio editing, um, anything where you are creating something net new, that is where these generative AI models and language models can, can see the most benefit. So I think that's why today you're seeing more enterprises and small and medium businesses uh, utilizing AI to kind of help accelerate their workflows and, and kind of make them faster across a, a bunch of different areas. For sure. I, I've definitely seen the enterprise uses of generative AI outpace the consumer uses. And it seems like even the companies themselves have figured that out. And, and the other thing is some, some of the stuff that you can do is amazing. You know, I used it over the weekend. I was trying to troubleshoot a string of lights that I was putting up a Christmas tree, right? And, and it gave me all the right directions about how to go fix this. But there's other areas where general consumers They'll go play with it and then go say, oh, for some real world use, it doesn't actually do the thing. Yeah, Ryan, I am looking for more useful consumer AI in 2025. I mean, we know NVIDIA is going to keep going great guns. These big companies are buying their gear left and right so that Microsoft and others can put out uh, AI software like their co-pilot. But I still have not seen the capabilities for the consumer part of that really take off yet. It's one of these areas I wrote an article not too long ago talking about how Microsoft and all of the consumer and PC AI integrations would benefit if Apple intelligence takes off. Even though it's a competitor and even though they compete for the same consumer dollar, Apple has a way of making things happen in the consumer space that nobody else can do. And adoption and acceptance of that will rise interest in everything else around it. Before we go, it's time for what we're watching. A look at the news you need to know for the rest of the week and beyond. Early holiday shopping showed little reason to worry about Americans' willingness to spend. The number of people shopping in person on Black Friday and the following weekend increased from last year, according to the National Retail Federation, and online shoppers spent a record amount from Thanksgiving through Cyber Monday, according to Adobe, more than $41 billion. The U.S. economy has been driven by consumer spending, and we aren't seeing that come to an end just yet. Shopping results will not be the most important economic data this week, however. On Friday, the November jobs report will arrive and give more insight into a confusing and uneven labor market. After September's job gains far outpaced expectations and October disappointed with meager additions, this report will be crucial to the Federal Reserve members who meet in less than two weeks. Make sure to check for live coverage Friday on MarketWatch.com and come back next week for more. And that's it for this episode. To keep following the latest financial news, head to MarketWatch.com. Have questions about the news and the economy? We want to hear them. You can reach us at OnWatch at MarketWatch.com. You can subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcasts, and please do. If you like what you heard, please leave us a rating or review. It really helps others discover the show. The show is hosted by me, Jeremy Owens, and produced by Alexis Moore. Isaac Gaines mixed this episode. Melissa Haggerty is the executive producer. We'll be back next week with a new episode. And until then, we'll be watching.